to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. This episode today, this conversation that we are about to have, is the one that I have looked forward to more than anything else the entire time that we have been doing this podcast. I am so excited about this. But at the same time, this isn't what we thought it would have been. Like, we had this idea, but we had to get ourselves here with all our study and research and time and experience. It's not, oh, someday we're going to do that episode. We had an episode like this in mind, but it's not what we thought it was going to be. Yeah, for sure. When we develop an episode, sometimes it'll take just a couple days. Usually it'll take a few weeks, maybe a couple months. But honestly, this one is, what, 75 episodes in the making? Yeah, it's been brewing for a little while. Yeah, and it just happens that this is like the perfect time to have this conversation. And we were going to do it anyway, but there's a lot of things going on in the Air Force right now with General Brown's Accelerate, Change, or Lose and his CSAF action items that now is really like the perfect time for us to be talking about this. Yeah, and he and Chief Bass have been posting a lot lately about the increased alignment between the officer and enlisted evaluation systems and the continuing improvement process that's happening right now to get those adjusted. And this is totally in line with that effort. Yeah, for sure. So why am I so excited about having this conversation? Because I at least felt while I was going through my active duty career all the way up to this point, and during my time as an instructor at Air Force ROTC, it became clear to me that the Air Force's approach to the production and development of officers was off the mark. In fact, my thought was that we weren't exactly sure what that mark was supposed to be to begin with. Yeah. And you and I had many a conversation, right? As you were in ROTC and I was at OTS, you came to Maxwell to do the officer instructor course training that you have to do to be a ROTC instructor. Yeah. And we both looked at each other near the end of your time and we're like, is this it? Like we couldn't put our finger on it, but it just didn't quite feel like we had a definition of what we were trying to do. Yes, we saw the check marks on the sheet of what needed to happen. We couldn't put our finger on what it was. And it wasn't really until General Goldfein in 2019 kind of outlined what it was that we valued in an officer with his four categories of execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, and improve the unit, all on a foundation of character that we saw the first light bulb moment, oh, this is what an officer is supposed to do. Yeah. And that's when we realized, hey, this is an AFI 1-2 commander's responsibilities. And so we did a bunch of episodes on that because that was our first understanding of what it was that we're supposed to do. So Colin, I don't know if you know this, but those episodes that we did have not done well. <laughs> And yeah, I do know that. And I'm trying to wrap my brain around why that is the case. Well, so I've been thinking about that. I think it's reasonable to see if you're not a commander, that those four things don't resonate with you. I think yeah. that that's fair. They aren't sexy. This is not light your hair on fire, go fast, <laughs> blow up stuff. It sounds boring and like work. Yeah, yeah. And so, and the other thing though, I think the biggest thing is these four things outside of AFI 1-2 are wholly separate and removed from everything mm -hmm. else that we see. We're not rated on these things. It's like these amorphous, detached things that are out there. I don't see them on my Airman Comprehensive Assessment. I don't hear them on my OPR. These are not messages that are pounded into us at training. They're just out there. So I don't know that 
anybody has anything to tie this to relevant to their experience. So that's why I think if I tell you an officer's job is to manage resources, it doesn't connect for anything. And that's yeah. my thoughts on why those haven't done well. Yeah. If I were to put a quick explanation to what an officer does and what the Air Force values about what an officer does, it would always have been that we organize, train, and equip. Organize, train, and equip. That was like the buzz phrase the, yeah. that I would use, especially while I was in ROTC as an instructor, as a recruiter, talking to cadets about what it is that I'm evaluating them on, potential cadets coming into the program, explaining to them the stuff that they are going to be learning. That was the phrase that just always came up was that organize, train, and equip, as opposed to execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, improve the unit. Man, it just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well as organize, train, and equip. Yeah. But even that, I still felt like it was missing the mark and that there was more to it. And, you know, whatever the reason is for why people don't know those particular parts of AFI 1-2, why those episodes didn't perform well, I think that's the conversation that you and I need to have, Reed, is... What does the Air Force value? And also, probably more importantly, what should it value? And like I was saying that this is the perfect time to have that conversation, that's because very recently, just within the last few weeks, the Air Force has released an update to the AFI 362406, which is the AFI that governs the evaluation system for both officer and enlisted airmen. And on top of that, there's a new addendum, Air Force Form 724-A, to the Airman Comprehensive Assessment. Yeah, so quick review, the Airman Comprehensive Assessment is a document provided by the Air Force to help guide initial, midterm, and final feedback sessions. Generally, the first half of the document is the kind of stuff you'd expect, name, date, rank, all that kind of stuff. And then there's a bunch of, do you understand that it's important to not be a dirtbag? And you put a yes or a no. It's just yep. the ratee fills out a bunch of stuff. Then the rater has an opportunity to give you feedback on your performance. Exactly. And as we've mentioned, Colin, these performance categories that you're being rated on the ACA, they don't really feel connected to anything, yes, if you look at them, you're like, okay, that's important. But there's no like continuous thread that says, this is what's important, this is how I'm being held accountable, that standard, and it just doesn't continue. Anyway, so the ACA, generally real world, the Ray T fills out 90% of the thing, they hand it to the Raider, they may or may not have initial midterm or final feedback. I've had varying success with that. I've had it done once. Mentioned that back in the episode with Colonel Thaden. He's the only one that has ever done an ACA for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it is something. Let's start with that, right? And it's available. And it. I've had good feedback sessions with airmen that I've been leading using that as a tool. I do appreciate it. It does ask some hard questions. So it's got some benefits. But as Colin was mentioning, in that update, that addendum, it outlines a bunch of new things that, Colin, we're pretty excited about the Airman Leadership Qualities, or ALQs, and they align with those four characteristics in AFI 1-2. Yeah. What they're calling those four characteristics are major performance areas. And half in their announcement, half A1 said they encourage the field to provide their reactions and inputs when given the opportunity to do so. So Colin, you and I, we're going to give our feedback of this document, which we've had for, you know, about two weeks now. And that's what we're here to do today. Yeah, absolutely. But before we give our reaction, I think we should help the audience, those who are maybe driving in their car or doing a workout right now who can't read the thing, which we have included in the show notes so everybody can access it when you're ready to. Let's talk a little bit more about what these ALQs are, these airman leadership qualities, and how they fit within those major performance areas found in AFI 1-2. And so one thing that I want to mention as well is that each of these different ALQs comes with a rubric, which I think is a fantastic thing to provide a little bit of expectation around how you grade 
each of these different ALQs. And again, that is also included in the show notes so everybody can take a look at it. All right, so the first major performance area, no surprise here, is the execution of the mission. And there are three ALQs in here. And just so you know, when there are more ALQs within a single major performance area, to me, that kind of signals that this is more important than the others. At least that's the way that I see it. I don't know if that's how half sees it, but that's the impression it gives to me. It's also what's going to happen. It's going to be weighted towards the things that there are more things to grade on. Yeah, So for sure. That's just how it's going to shake out. Yeah. So within executing the mission, there are three ALQs. The first one, no surprises here either, job proficiency. We care about how well you do your job. But half is also saying they want to see your initiative and adaptability. So those are the three that are in that first area. And then the second one, again, no real surprise here, leading people. This one has three ALQs as well. Inclusion and teamwork is the first one, emotional intelligence and communication. Yeah, so those all make sense. And it also makes sense that they're the first two. There's something Colin, you and I talk about, technician or how good you are at your job versus leader. So I think it definitely puts those up there and says, these are the two things you're responsible to do as an officer. So the next major performance area is managing resources. And there are two ALQs in this one, the first being stewardship. In other words, how you manage what you've been assigned and accountability, how you are accountable for what you've been tasked with. The last major performance area is improving the unit. And there are two ALQs in this one, the first being decision-making and the last being innovation. And these major performance areas and ALQs, this addendum is to be used for senior NCOs and all officers 01 and up. Which is interesting to me because I think that these ALQs could still apply to an E1 through E6, but they have specifically stated the ACA addendum is to be used optionally right now, mandatory later on Mm -hmm. in the performance feedback for senior NCOs and up. Yeah. And real fast, we haven't mentioned this and some may be aware, some may not. The ACA is between the rater and the ratee. This is not filed. It doesn't accompany the OPR when it goes up for routing. And so you can use this document to maybe be more aggressive than you would in an OPR in order to try to give meaningful feedback. And I suspect the same when this thing becomes mandatory for use, the same will be the case. Yeah. And they're not going to say, well, I want to see your midterm ratings when I see your OPR. This isn't the tool for that. This is to help encourage some honest feedback. Yeah, absolutely. The ACA and the ACA addendum are not going to meet a promotion board or anything like that. So yeah, yeah, good point. So Colin, first impressions, what do you think? Oh, okay. I don't hate it. Let me just start there. Okay. Yeah. In fact, there's quite a few things that I really like about this. I already mentioned the inclusion of a rubric. I think that is fantastic. So glad that they have put the time and the effort to build that out for us because it's going to make doing midterm feedback so much easier because you don't have to solve the, the equation every single time you sit down with a rater or a to have a conversation around their performance. So my hope is that is going to make it take much less time and therefore make it much more likely that this is going to get used. Yeah. So I actually had midterm feedback yesterday. Wow. Okay. My raider, who's an 06 and vice wing commander, so pretty busy, contacted me and said, hey, Major Gan, it is time for your midterm feedback. And after I picked my jaw up off the floor, (laughs) I uh, sent in my ACA and I attached the addendum because it's brand new. And so when we actually had our session, this was their first time to interact with the document. Again, they're running around being super busy trying to lead 7,000 airmen. And we had a really good discussion about this because what we talked about is how we think this new addendum and these ALQs is going to shape what our OPRs look like and the potential change of a new OPR. We know that's been coming. Yeah, This might give us a peek behind the curtain of what they're looking at. Same general impression. Overall, there's a lot of goodness here. 
Something I want to highlight, though, and it gets to something you were saying earlier. A lot of this will come down to how it is used. Mm -hmm. They could give us the best tool on the planet, but if people don't use it appropriately or choose not to use it at all, it's not going to change anything. So I, too, Colin, am very encouraged by this. I think there's a lot of goodness. I think later we're going to get into some issues that we may have with it. But overall, I love what they're doing. Yeah. They're highlighting these are the things that we care about. These are the things we want to see you thinking about. And also, I think this tool as a leader, Colin, you and I have done the racking and stacking. We've done this a lot. Yep. And yep. the worst feeling in the world is when someone comes up to you and they're like, hey, you put me middle of the pack. Why? And you can't produce anything you're just yep. because that's you don't know and it's the worst feeling in the world and you don't like that i like this tool because if i think if a leader is very consciously evaluating their folks in these 10 areas and really paying attention and saying i have not had an opportunity to see this person improve the unit i just haven't seen it yeah they're going to create those opportunities or they're going to go seek those out so that they can more fully flesh out this document they're going to be able to answer that question and I think that's good for the Raider. I think that's good for the Ray T. And I think that's overall good for the Air Force. But it's not going to solve things overnight. Absolutely. This is not a magic pill that's going to make everything fine. We have to choose how to use it and we have to do it. And that still falls on us, the fleshy meat bags that are the weak link in the whole chain. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with you. It falls on us. But generally speaking, I think that you and I can see the vision of what they're trying to do. And it's a vast improvement over what we had previously as far as the expectations for major performance areas and those universal skill sets that General Brown has asked for. Because prior to now, we really just had nothing, which is what we were saying at the beginning of the episode, is that it wasn't clear really until General Goldfein outlined it in his memo back in August of 2019 that there was finally a kind of a coherent structure to what the Air Force values in its officers. Yeah, because basically what we're told, and we'll get into this in future episodes, is you are your strat and your push line on the OPR. That's it. And this was the first time we had a structure, like you said, to actually quantify, well, what does that mean? Yeah, so absolutely love that now we have something as opposed to nothing and moving us in the right direction, for sure. The tricky thing about this, though, is that defining a universal set of competencies for officers is that we do so many things. And it feels like half is trying to capture that here. Kind of feels like they're trying to boil the ocean by writing down everything that it is that we do. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that or what they've identified is wrong or misdirected, but man, there's a lot here. Yeah. And that was my very first impression is there's just too many. Even, you know, Colin, when you were talking earlier, Organized Training and Equip, it even has a nice little acronym, O T N E, mm -hmm. like just rolls, like it just, it resonates, it makes sense. And I'm a little worried that when we're doing our day-to-day, -day, when I'm a leader trying to evaluate my folks, when I'm out there doing the J-O-B and I'm trying to think about what I can do to get better, I'm a little worried that these 10 things aren't easy to remember. They don't rattle off the tongue. They don't fit into speeches. They don't fit on cute little motivational posters. They're just, it just I'm a little worried that it's going to be hard to connect with these 10 things. And... I get it. 10's a nice round number. I'm with you. It does feel like we're trying to boil the ocean. I'm just, I'm worried about the ability of the average Joe or Jane to connect to these 10 things. That's, my, I think, the first and biggest overall impression for me. Yeah, for sure. We've proved it out in that we did episodes on these four things. And I think we probably addressed, I mean, have to go back and look more closely at, at what we said there. But we probably talked about the 10 ALQs in those four episodes. And how well have those episodes performed? Not well. Yeah. Of all the things that we have talked about in the last year and a half, those are the least popular episodes that we've done. Yeah. It's tough. Again, this type of thing is not sexy. 
you know, when people are thinking about joining the Air Force, they're like, I wonder what it is that I'm going to be evaluated about. I don't know that these four things just, I, I just, it's tough, but it is so important. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit in this and, and in our next episode. We measure what we care about, and that drives a lot of behavior. Other thoughts, Colin? What, are, what else are you thinking? Yeah, so my other thought here is that the 10 ALQs and the major performance areas are incomplete, which is funny because we were just saying how <laughs> that there's too much going on here. Yeah. And the thing that I think is missing from here is that there's not a whole lot of emphasis on character, that the primary emphasis, and we see that in the ALQs themselves, is on executing the mission or your proficiency within your job, as well as leading airmen. Both good things, but neither of them really talks about like you as a person, which I think is central to being an officer. And it may be that character is so foundational that it doesn't need to be mentioned at all. But I would make the argument that it should be front and center, that it should be the primary thing that we are talking about and not just assuming that it's in place. Yeah, this is a really tough thing. I remember at OTS when we were being trained on how to evaluate students. We even taught this when we were talking about how to give feedback, that it needs to be about performance, not personality. Do you remember that? That kind yep. of, yeah, you can't. When you're going to have a difficult conversation about how someone is doing, it's important to not make them feel like this is about who they are as a human being. It's more about their performance, right? So yeah. you don't say, you're clearly an idiot. You say something like, the performance that you demonstrated does not meet the standard. Right. You sanitize it like that. Yeah. Make it less about them, but more about the issue at hand, which is a great feedback tool. Yes. And absolutely, you should do that. Yeah. Because if you want them to be receptive to what you're saying, you can't start out with, you must be an idiot. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to shut things down. It's not going to happen. Yeah. But if you can say, the performance you gave me did not meet standards, that's a whole different thing. But I think what that does is it does remove us a little bit from talking about character. And Colin, and I back me up on this. Some of the hardest conversations I ever had was with students who had given me reason to not trust them. Yeah. And I had to have a character question, character feedback, character discussion. And in this age when toxic leadership is such a hot topic in the Air Force, yeah, I too think it's so foundational, it should go without saying, but I feel like we may have missed an opportunity to have that on this document and to have somebody seriously look you in the eye and say, you screwed up and here's where. Yeah. You know, it was simple things at OTS. It was an alarm clock set an hour before the authorized time to wake up. Uh-oh, are you waking up early? You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Why is your alarm clock set early? Like, that's a hard conversation. Are you breaking the rules willingly? Because you had to deliberately set your alarm clock. You know, that, yeah. that sounds like a silly, crazy thing. But if I'm there to evaluate if I should put special trust and confidence in you, that's the kind of stuff that I have to use to measure. I just, I think we, like you, I think we may have missed a little bit here. But at the same time, it's so foundational, it should go without saying. So I'm definitely on both sides on this one. I think, yeah, this is a tough one. Yeah, and if you think about the high-vis, high-ranking leaders that have been removed from their positions in the last few years, both in the Air Force and outside of it, it's never about their job performance. It's always about their character and the loss of that special trust and confidence from a raider to a raidee, from a supervisor to a subordinate officer. It's never about their proficiency within their job or their ability to lead effectively. It's always about who they are and the poor choices that they've made. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if we're given that feedback early and often enough. I can't believe that someone gets to be a two, three, four star general and then gets subsequently removed from command because of a lack of confidence Yeah, without there being something along the way. I just... I don't know that I find that really hard to believe. So I think that's what we're both hitting on a little bit. Yeah. All right, Reed. So we've 
poked enough holes into the ALQs. And we just want to emphasize the point again here that we actually think that this is a great first step. We are very pleased with what half A1 has produced and is giving us the opportunity to start using, test it out, prove it out, see if it's going to work for us, and then to provide this type of feedback back to them so that we can all work together on making the Air Force better. Yes. So people, use it. (laughs) <laughs> right? We had the ACA. We had the OPR. The whole system is not bad, right? It's not a sentient being which makes decisions to ruin your life, okay? It's people who use these tools. Yeah. And so please use it correctly. I think just too much it wasn't used well or they didn't take it seriously or they just didn't do it at all with feedback especially. So please take the opportunity. They've given us some good tools. Let's take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so in an effort to provide further solutions or suggestions on the improvement of this product, Reed, you and I would like to share some of our own thoughts on what we think the ACA or just the idea of what an officer should be. We want to provide a little bit more from the discussions that we've had previously that are going to look different than what's here in the ACA addendum. It's not that those things are wrong. But we feel that there are other ways to make this much better. Yeah. And as we've caveated before, we are not experts in this. We've not spent years of our lives dedicated to this. We're coming at this as folks who are in the system, who've used these tools and have given it some thought. But that's the beauty of our system, Colin, is that we make the rules of the club. Yep. And we're voting members, if you will. And these are our votes. And so take it with the grain of salt that we've pretty healthily sprinkled on top here. But at the same time, this is one of the greatest things about being in the service is that we own this. So this is our attempt to try and humbly make it a little bit better, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So we feel that the best way to approach this is to examine the commission itself. Why do we have a commission to begin with? And then what is it that an officer is supposed to do with it? Those two things we feel deserve their own episodes, but we're going to try to address them at least in part to help us to provide that feedback to what we think that we really should be valuing in our officers. And later on, here's a preview for what's coming over the next few weeks. We want to have a conversation around how you evaluate these things, how you recruit it, develop it, and produce the officers that we need for the Air Force. So like I said, we want to start with What is a commission to begin with? This comes from the Armed Forces Officer. It says, the commission is granted under the president's powers in Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. It is a notice of appointment, a grant of executive authority, and an admonition for obedience. It is bestowed because of the, quote, special trust and confidence reposed by the president in the appointee. Special trust and confidence, Reed. We've both used that phrase a number of times. Just in today's episode, we've brought it up over the course of other episodes that we have done. We feel that is the commission, is that special trust and confidence. That's where we need to begin this conversation. Yeah, 100%. You know, we started off this entire podcast asking that question, what is the commission? Yeah. At the time, we didn't have a really good answer. We said some stuff. But I think if you had to put it into a single short phrase, special trust and confidence, that's it. You know, and think about some of the greatest military leaders of the last few generations. Colin Powell will absolutely come to mind. Yeah. When he was asked, what is the key characteristic of leadership? Without hesitation, his answer, trust. We've got a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, there's a fantastic video about that press conference. And Highly recommend everybody go listen to it because it's that good. Just his ability to distill leadership and officership down into a single word. Yeah. Trust. So good. And if I think about it, as I look back, it's dawned on me, right? I look back into everything we were doing at OTS. That's what we were doing. We were giving an opportunity for the students to demonstrate their worthiness for that special trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why I didn't see it then. I wonder what it was. Maybe I got caught up in the day-to-day, in the minutia. I'm not sure. But boy, in retrospect, it's so clear. 
I was giving them opportunities to demonstrate that they were worthy of the trust and confidence of the United States. It's so clear now. It is so clear. That is what we were doing. Well, I'll tell you why it wasn't clear then, because we didn't have this coherent structure of the ACA and these major performance areas or what we feel now or what we think should be included on an ACA that didn't exist before, but now it does. And so looking back, yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. but being able to look back through this lens of these major performance areas and this coherent structure of what we value in our officers, it absolutely makes sense that our commissioning sources, OTS, Air Force Academy, ROTC, these are designed to give cadets the ability to demonstrate their worthiness of that special trust and confidence. And for cadre, officers who have already earned the commission, to say, yes, this is the kind of person that I want to bestow that special trust and confidence in. Yeah, absolutely. But I have to ask now, where does that special trust and confidence come from? How do we know that someone is worthy of it? How can the president of the United States or the lowest ranking airman or the American people just in general know that someone is deserving of that special trust and confidence? So we've talked about this a little bit already. It came up in last week's episode. We were talking about the different things that we felt an officer should be. You mentioned learn, serve, lead. I mentioned the topics of stress inoculation, well of fortitude, being a father or mother figure, and how all of those map to three primary areas or characteristics or competencies. Those are competence, connection, and character. And those three things come from John Maxwell in his book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He talks about the law of solid ground being the combination of these three things in order to generate trust. He says, to build trust, a leader must exhibit competence, connection, and character. And so we feel pretty strongly that those three C's are the universal skill sets or qualities that every officer should have. Yeah. And so brief explanation of each, you know, just a quick examination of what we're talking about. So competence, right? The ability to do something successfully, to do it well. How good are you at what we have asked you to do? Yeah. Okay. Connection. Are you able to connect with other people, with teams, with individuals? And then last, character. What are the moral, ethical qualities that you exude that define your character? How does that measure up? Do you meet what we need? And it makes sense, right, as a source of trust, these three things. If you aren't good at what you are asked to do, they may salute you because you wear the rank, but they're not going to really care about what you have to say if you can't get them where they need to go, right? If you can't get the team across the finish line, yep, they'll salute you and say, yes, sir, or ma'am, but they're just not going to connect. They're not going to have faith and trust that you can do what you need to do. And connection. I mean, we could go on and on about this one. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to be the most popular guy or gal in the squadron, but don't be that guy. Don't be that girl that people follow you because they fear you. They should want to be with you. And again, it's a balance, right? You don't want to just be the popular guy or gal, but you have to be able to connect with people. And at worst, you could create just a nightmare of an environment if you're just a terrible, awful human being. And without character, people are not going to care. If they can't look at you and see themselves in you and their ideals for what they want, it's just not going to work. I mean, it's hard to even describe these three things without the word trust. Yeah, <laughs> They're so integral to it. I'm finding I'm unable to bring up the things I'm talking about because they're just these are the core components of trust. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see, Reed, from your explanation of these three C's, how well they correlate to the major performance areas and the airman leadership qualities that have been provided by HAF. Oh, in the totally. ACA and AFI 36-2406, right? Yeah. In fact, I wanted to see how well these correlate. So I did a little exercise. I took the table that's in the AFI and I created a key and I color-coded the different words based on how well they map with 
competence connection character. And I was really struck by what I found that there is a very heavy emphasis on competence. No real surprise there. We've talked about why that is the case and much less so on connection and very little on character. And we ask ourselves, why our airmen complain of toxic leadership or their inability to trust that their leaders, that their officers have their best interest at heart? Yeah, we've talked about this over and over. As an institution, we recruit, train, develop, and promote tactical proficiency. And we are therefore very competent. Yep. As a killing machine, we are pretty good at that. But I don't know that we're doing enough to connect and demonstrate character. And that's what I think we need to get after. I think we need to emphasize that more because that's why people are getting out. Yeah. I have never one time had an airman say, my leader is not tactically proficient. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm going to leave. I've never one time heard that. I've never, ever heard. My squadron commander is not a good intelligence officer. Therefore, I am separating. It is always, they don't care about me. They don't know me. They're making decisions that are hurting the mission or hurting airmen, and I can't take it anymore. That's why they're getting out. Never tactical proficiency. As an officer corps, I just don't know that we've done enough to record, measure, count, account for character. And as a result, I think as an institution, we need to recruit, train, develop, and promote character because that's the issue. Yes, we focus on tactical proficiency, and so we're good at it. I think we need to balance that with more character. Yeah. So I love the three Cs because they're easy to remember. They roll off the tongue. I think people can relate to them, and everyone knows what they mean. I feel like that ability to connect with the information is just there a little bit more easy than it is with the 10 ALQs. Yeah, Reed, I absolutely agree with you. There's not really an easy way to remember the ALQs. It's not a, a fancy acronym that I can think of. And like you said, they don't just roll off the tongue. It, where competence, connection, character, they all you know, start the same way. Yeah, they don't rhyme, but they're very easy to remember, I think. Yeah. And I'm just going to keep going with the theme of alliteration. I think there's some other Cs. Commission, right? Yeah. They tie into what it is to be commissioned. And here's my favorite one, though, command. This is another C. And inherent in every commission is the potential for command. We've talked about this on and off on this podcast as well as offline, Colin. Something that's become much more clear to me is how important and how central the ultimate purpose of the commission is to command. Yeah. I mean, we all know that, right? We all talk about it in the recruiting speeches and in the early days of second lieutenantdom. They're like, oh, all of you could become the chief of staff someday. And we have these great visions of, all. I mean, it's baked in, but I didn't feel it as much as I have over the last few months, especially going through ACSC and correspondence and really studying the joint publications. You know, it's not even just command. Ultimately, it's a joint force commander, a yeah. JFC. I mean, that's really everything is shaped to push and develop and create that guy or gal who can lead the men and women of the United States Armed Forces and our combined partners yeah. to success in combat. I mean, that's the whole point. We've had some really interesting conversations about this. It's been very instructive to me as you've been going through this and sharing your thoughts. And I'm so excited for you to now share that with the audience, the things that you've been learning and, and studying over the last few months. Yeah, so I'm going to pull out some of the more salient parts of the joint pubs. Light reading, they are not. <laughs> But very interesting still. I mean, this is what we do. And I've really had to get into those docs a little bit more. We're going to start with Joint Pub 3.0, which is operations, you know, pretty simply. Something even, you know, Klaschwitz says, when all is said and done, it is really the commander's cold delay. I, I don't speak French, so forgive me. His ability to see things simply, to identify the whole business of war completely with himself. That is the essence of good generalship. So this idea of being able to summarize and comprehend what you see as a whole in a comprehensive, quick view. And again, to continue on with Joint Pub 3.0, commanders, command forces operating as part of a multinational military force. 
they have the authority and the responsibility to organize, direct, coordinate, and control military forces to accomplish the assigned mission. And for a JFC, that's win wars. Yeah. So no pressure, but the whole thing's up to you. And last part, as a result of their leadership, they need to create a culture, which we've talked about mission command or mission type orders, where they've communicated a vision, an end goal so clearly and up and down the entire chain that anyone at the very lowest levels could be completely cut off from any daily or regular guidance and direction, and they'd still be able to accomplish the mission. So that is the responsibility of a JFC. And everything that we do, our recruiting, our training, our education, our force structure, the responsibilities of different echelons of command, all of that is ultimately to build that person. And that has really become solidified in my mind as I, you know, have studied this a whole lot more. So what you're saying, Reed, is that if we continue with our three C's model, competence, connection, character, those three things are what get you in the door to earn the commission. But also those things have to continue to grow and develop over the course of time in order to produce someone who is ready to command and not just command at the squadron or even at the wing level, but to be a joint force commander. Absolutely. And at every level, the things that are expected of your competence changes. The things that are expected of your connection change. Mm -hmm. And character, I think, is the one that's not going to change. It's just going to increase in the severity of making a mistake. Yeah. So, you know, for example, let's take connection. Second lieutenant in a security forces squadron, they need to be able to lead all their folks. They need to connect with them. A three-star general, you know, with a coalition force bringing the fight against the enemy in some far-off country, they need to connect with multiple nations. Mm -hmm. They need to connect with military forces that all speak different languages. I mean, the connection is very different, right? So I think the three C's really adjust well, but I, I think they absolutely apply. Yeah, that's so fascinating to me that if you think about it in this way, in terms of the special trust and confidence that is originally given to a new officer that only grows and intensifies over the course of time and experience that ultimately produces that joint force commander who is able to do all those things, but it's still the same principles. It's still their competence, their connection, their character, utilizing that commission, which is their authority to act on behalf of the president of the United States and the American people in this very specific and important and critical position of command. Yeah. And that's the thing. Even if you don't want to be a commander, the machine is pushing you in that direction. We've talked about that. You had that you know, really good discussion with Colonel Thaden. And this is a regular discussion. People just want to do their J-O-B, but this is what the force is pushing us to develop, to become because of our commission, because of the potential of command and the centrality to competence, connection, and character, which, yes, that's a lot of C's. I've had fun with the alliteration today, but <laughs> I think it matters because you're not going to forget them. Yeah. They ring true. They all tie together. So that's my final thoughts on that is, is I think... The ALQs are great. I'm so grateful we have this rubric, this structure, this framework. I don't know that it's my favorite, and I think we've discussed some reasons why. Yeah. I love the three Cs too, not just because they roll off the tongue because they're easy to remember, but I think they don't require a whole lot of explanation. People know what it looks like for someone who has character. They know what it's like to have a connection with other people. We can all look at an individual and their performance and can say that person is competent. Therefore, let's give them a commission, that special trust and confidence, and build them up eventually to become a commander. It just makes so much sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. So we've talked about a bunch of stuff today, and hopefully you won't forget these three Cs. They've definitely imprinted themselves on you and I, Colin. But just like half A1 is asked, we want to know what you think. They've asked for feedback on these ALQs, and we're asking for the same. Lieutenant General Kelly, who's currently the A1 at Headquarters Air Force, 
He's been quoted numerous times in saying, I'm 100% confident that half doesn't have this 100% right. I love Mm -hmm. that, by the way. He's just unabashed. Okay, I'm trying to get this right, but I know I'm not. Let us know what you think. And let us know if, what do you think about the ALQs? What do you think about our five Cs or C5, whatever you want to call it, or just the three Cs? Let us know what you're thinking because they have asked for feedback. Use this tool. Tell us what you think. Is this better? What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Let them know. Let us know. You can join us in the conversation within the Heritage Room. You can send us your thoughts through social media. You can email us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. But the most important thing here that we need to remember is that we own this. We are the officers of the United States Air Force. This is our officer corps. We get to decide who gets into this club and what that club is going to look like. So we really need to work together to make this the best possible product that we can. Absolutely. And with that, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed.